Okay, hello to everyone. It's very nice to see you all. Today, we're very happy to kick off the new year 2023 with Thomas Mertens, who is going to be telling us about uh, from JT to 3D pure gravity. So Thomas, take it away. Okay, so first of all, thanks for inviting me. Oh, is my camera off? Uh, yes, okay. oh, now it's on. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what happened here, okay. <laughs> Uh, so thanks for inviting me uh, to give this talk, which will be uh, mostly based on this first paper that I mentioned here in collaboration with uh, Joanne Simon and Gabriel Wong that came out last um, October. Um, so <coughs> let me first start by uh, giving you uh, an introduction to lower dimensional gravity. So in the past uh, seven years or so, we have seen many developments in lower dimensional gravity models and their solutions, in particular in two dimensional uh, JT gravity. Uh, we have learned about the exact quantum solutions of uh, the partition function and boundary correlation functions and their interpretation in terms of gravitational uh, physics, so uh, shockwave scattering. Uh, we have learned a couple of years ago about uh, the relevance of uh, higher genus and multi-boundary amplitudes, which have proven to be important to understand the very late time behavior of boundary correlation functions and to explain uh, the page curve. And another uh, development is that uh, we have gained a at least partially a better understanding of the second order versus the first order uh, formulation of gravity. So the, the metric description versus the gauge theoretic description of uh, JT gravity. And this particular uh, aspect I want to, uh, well, will be of relevance for the remainder of my talk. And of course, many more aspects uh, that I won't mention here. So of course, it would be interesting to extend our class of solvable models to find out how generic some of these lessons are. And the goal of this uh, talk will be to develop uh, 3D pure gravity in a way that parallels um, what we understand uh, about two-dimensional JT gravity. Now, I immediately want to make two uh, disclaimers here. Uh, the first is that I will not be talking about any higher genus effects uh, throughout my talk. And then the second uh, comment is that uh, many formulas, at least in the first part of my talk, are already known from earlier work uh, by other people. And we will try to put them together in one story. Um, so first, a uh, brief reminder about Jacques Teilbaum or JT gravity. So it's a particular model of two-dimensional dilaton gravity. So I've written down the Euclidean action here on a manifold with a boundary, so with the gibbons hawking boundary term. Phi is a dilaton field, R is the two-dimensional uh, Ricci scalar. Now, um, while well, this model was proposed by uh, Jacques and Teilbaum in the 80s, and very soon thereafter, uh, people realized that the first order formulation of JT gravity can be written in terms of a gauge theory based on the PSL2R um, symmetry algebra, a BF gauge theory. Now, uh, there are several motivations for study studying that particular model of uh, lower dimensional dilaton gravity, JD gravity. Uh, first of all, it appears quite universally as the near horizon theory of near extremal higher dimensional black holes. Um, second motivation, and this is how it appeared in 2015 by Kitaev's work, it describes the low energy sector of all known SYK-like uh, models. And then thirdly, as I mentioned on the previous slide already, it is solvable, including coupling to bulk uh, matter fields. And then uh, well, one further motivation, and this is uh, the motivation that I want to be thinking about, is you can get this model directly as a spherically symmetric dimensional reduction of 3D uh, pure gravity. So 3D pure gravity and 2D JT gravity are, are strong, strongly related. Um, now, I also want to, well, briefly remind you of some of the, the equations that we will need for reference later on for JT gravity. So the disk partition function for JT gravity has been computed exactly, uh, and it's given by this expression, an integral over a momentum variable k, a measure k sin 2 pi k, and then uh, the Boltzmann weight e to the minus beta k squared. Now, in the thermodynamic limit, which is the, the saddle of this, uh, of this canonical partition function, uh, well, the density of states in terms of the k variable, so it's k sinh 2 pi k, you approximate the sinh by an exponential, and then you solve for the saddle equation uh, of, of this integral, and you find the relation between uh, k and beta, the inverse temperature of that system. So this uh, is the is a, a first law that you find there. And this then leads to a thermal entropy in this thermodynamic limit of 2 pi times this value of k, which is log of uh, this, this uh, density of states at large values of k. Now, this thermal entropy, it matches with the bakerstein hawking entropy of the classical black hole in JT gravity. So this is one of the, let's say, early successes of this, of this model. 
um, that it matches with um, the geometrical aspects of uh, classical JT gravity. Uh, and the second thing, the second object that I will need, uh, at least for, for, well, I will need at one point during my talk is the boundary two point function. So we have two boundary operators at the boundary of our uh, JT disk and their correlator has been computed exactly. And this is the expression. So it's an integral over two of these momentum variables, K1 and K2. Both of these integrals have the same K sinh two by K measure. There's these Boltzmann factors again, where tau is the difference uh, in Euclidean time between these two boundary insertions and beta min minus tau is then the complement. And then you have these gamma functions that complicate things and that link these integrals together into something uh, non-trivial. Okay, so this is the end of my review. Um, so now let's immediately uh, try to think about uh, higher dimensional gravity models and in particular 3D gravity. <clears throat> uh, and well, I, I will try to make uh, a proposal on this slide for a particular uh, interesting model that is the direct analog of JT gravity in lower dimensions. So let's start with uh, a discrete microscopic two-dimensional CFT, which has a modular invariant uh, torus partition function. So very generically, I'm writing down this expression here. So these m h h bar are just integers labeling how many times different primaries appear uh, in the spectrum and the chi h of tau are, are suitable characters. Uh, and this is a modern inference. So of course it satisfies this uh, property in particular. Um, and then, well, just some notation, the conformal weight delta is the sum of h and h bar and the angular momentum j is h minus h bar or the spin. Um, and the modular parameter uh, of, of our torus tau will be identified physically uh, as the real part being a chemical potential and the imaginary part being the inverse temperature. And this L here will be the ADS length in the bulk. Now we will assume uh, that this, this model only has the Firasoro symmetry. So these characters here would just be Firasoro characters. So I'm writing out the characters here for completeness. So the vacuum Firasoro character looks like that. And a generic non-degenerate Firasoro character looks like this, where this Q is as usual e to the two pi i tau, where tau is the, uh, the modulus of the torus. And this eta function is just the standard uh, Dedekind eta function. Now for sufficiently high temperatures of this, of this system, so and well, by sufficiently high, I mean that beta over L, so the inverse temperature divided by the ADS length has to be uh, smaller uh, then the spectral gap, so the, the gap between uh, the vacuum and the first uh, excited primary state in, in this CFT. Um, in that case, uh, the vacuum dominates in the dual channel, since you can just compute this ratio of, of generic um, uh, non-degenerate characters in the dual channel. So with tau replaced by minus one over tau, you can um, consider the ratio of their contribution to the partition function compared to the, the contribution from the vacuum. And you find that if this uh, inequality is true, that this is going to zero. Uh, and then this total torus partition function, uh, which was the general expression here, can be approximated in this regime by just the vacuum in the dual channel. Now, of course, um, vacuum model dominance in 2D CFT has been studied a lot by many people. So here I've just written a few of the references that do that. And it is known that this uh, isolates the pure gravity subsector. But here I want to focus on this vacuum being present, the vacuum model being present in the dual channel and not in the, uh, the direct channel. Okay, so now uh, in this particular regime or torus partition function, we can rewrite this as a thermodynamically as a grand canonical partition function of a system uh, in its own right. So this was our approximation here. And now I just do the modular rest transform again to write it in this way. And the only thing I need is uh, how, well, the vacuum character uh, of the Virasoro algebra transforms under modular S transform, and it transforms in this way. So you have two integrals here. You have the Virasoro uh, modular S matrix, and then you have uh, two non-degenerate Virasoro characters. And this modular S matrix is known as sinh times sinh. Uh, well, and there's a parameter B here, and that B is related to the central charge of the CFT that we started with by this um, well-known formula. So this is well, the typical way to write things in the Uville CFT, but it, it holds generically for Virasoro CFTs. Um, so, so with this, our total uh, partition function, so, well, we can interpret this as a grand canonical partition function, and very explicitly, this is what it looks like. So I've just inserted the concrete form of the characters here and used the fact that tau was related to the inverse temperature and the chemical potential of our system. And these dimensions here, 
uh, well, I call them qu quantum dimensions. So, well, I will later come back to that interpretation or just this cinch times cinch. Um, and now this looks like a grand canonical partition function. And you can immediately see that, well, it describes a system with energies, these of the primary states in our spectrum given by P plus square plus P minus squared divided by the ADS, ADS length and angular momentum, just the difference between these two. Um, and well, the system, uh, it describes uh, a system, a thermodynamic system with a continuous spectrum that you can interpret as rotating BTZ black holes and the boundary graviton degrees of freedom, which are just, of course, encoded in these Dedekind functions that are here. Uh, and I should point out that, uh, well, the spectrum is continuous, despite the fact that we originally started with a discrete microscopic CFT. And, well, you can argue or you can, well, see that it's continuous as a result of this sort of high temperature limit that we have been taken, taking to isolate this vacuum character in the dual channel. So it's continuous as a result of some, well, something what you might call coarse, coarse graining in the high temperature regime of the underlying microscopics. Uh, and as a well, small comment, we also lose angular momentum quantization in this regime because the angular momentum P plus squared minus P minus squared is not necessarily quantized because we're just integrating over these P plus and P minus quantum numbers. So this is the, the dynamical system we get in this uh, high temperature regime of a generic CFT. Well, not the most generic one, but the one that satisfied these properties that I mentioned in the beginning. So here we have um, our expression again. So let's first of all try to look a little bit at the, the semi-classical regime of this uh, partition function. And the semi-classical regime, uh, it happens where large values of P plus and P minus appear in this integral. Uh, and well, this appears, or, or you can get this from small beta over L or large temperature. So we, we study this model in the large temperature limit, in which case we can approximate the hyperbolic sine functions that appear in these dimensions here by exponentials, just like we did uh, for JT gravity as well. And then secondly, of course, as, as is usual in, in ADS3 CFT2, um, setting C to be large corresponds uh, in, in, the, well, in the dual bulk to having the ADS length divide, well, uh, be, be much larger than uh, the 3D Newton constant. Now, uh, in this particular regime, in the semi-classical regimes, uh, descendants, uh, they are subdominant, so descendants don't carry the leading entropy, which uh, is something you can immediately see by looking at the Cardi formula in a uh, CFT with a central charge that's bigger than one, which is the case that we're focusing on. Uh, and from this, uh, you can again look at the saddle point equation of, this, of, this, uh, of these integrals, and you find um, that the, the saddle leads to an entropy, which is log of uh, and then the product of these two dimensions evaluated for large arguments. So for large P plus and large P minus. And you can explicitly uh, see that because these dimensions are cinch times cinch. So you replace them by exponentials. You take the log of these things. This is the dominating uh, piece. And this just matches with A over 4G, where A is the horizon length of our classical BTC black hole. So, so we get uh, the semi-classical uh, answers. Uh, of the of the BTC black hole, so we reproduce the BTC black hole entropy formula from the thermodynamics of this uh, of this partition function. Okay, so well, up to now I've motivated everything just from a particular uh, regime of of a generic two D CFT. Now let's start again. Uh, so so we forget everything that I said up to this point, and we start again with the pure gravity uh, path integral uh, on the interior of the solid torus. So we consider this three-dimensional action with the gibbons hawking boundary term um, and in a three-dimensional geometry uh, for which the boundary is, is a torus. Now, the steps to, uh, to evaluate the path integral uh, in 3D have been uh, studied by several groups. So I'm just going to go very schematically uh, through how you would do this or, or like, well, at least what is a, a way of, of seeing what the answer is. And that is to go through the first order formulation of 3D gravity. So the first step is you can rewrite 3D pure gravity as uh, two copies of the Chern-Simons theory based on the PSL2R group. Now, both of these Chern-Simons theories can then, well, because we're studying the interior of a, of a solid tor of a torus, you can rewrite these both as chiral WZW models that are living on the boundary. And then as a third step, we need to implement suitable boundary conditions. And these are uh, the fact that we're studying asymptotically ADS spaces. 
So we have asymptotic gravitational boundary conditions or brown hanau boundary conditions, and they allow you to reduce these chiral WZW models to the so-called alexeyev shatashvili cojoint orbit actions for the Virasoro group. Um, well, so this is just schematic. I'm not going to show you any equations for this, but this is a, a well-known strategy on how to handle 3D gravity. Um, but at this point, we still need to impose suitable holonomy conditions or suitable boundary conditions, if you will, around the torus cycles. Um, and our proposal, um, well, just the vacuum character and the individual channel, it just uh, corresponds to imposing trivial holonomy around the temporal cycle of this solar torus. So the actual geometry that we are studying is this, this solar torus where we have Euclidean time that I call TE and an angular coordinate that I call phi. But the phi coordinate is a non-contractible cycle here, and the TE coordinate would be the contractible one. So in the TE uh, direction, there's nothing in the interior, so there's a trivial holonomy there, and we get uh, this partition function again. So we, we can just get this immediately from pure gravity on its own. Now, uh, this, this um, well 3D gravity proposal, um, which was just this one, uh, let's discuss some of the properties. And the first one, of course, is it's not modular invariant. Now, of course, this is OK. Since we just took the limits of a modular invariant microscopic model, and then this limit isolated one of the characters in one of the channels. Uh, so of course, we're losing modular invariance if we're approximating this by just this character. Uh, but modular invariance is also not really required purely from the geometry in the ADS3 uh, space, from the asymptotics of the ADS3 space because the brown hanau analysis uh, shows uh, that there should be a left and right moving Virasoro algebra, which we have, but it doesn't necessarily imply that these should be uh, combined together in a modular invariant partition function. And indeed, if we follow these steps of the 3D gravity path integral to go to turn Simons, WCW, and these uh, cogent orbit actions, we can indeed, with suitable boundary conditions, uh, get just this thing on its own. Um, a second property of this of this uh, of, of you or trying to view this thing as a 3D uh, gravity. All right, proposal. can I pause for, for just a second there? That's sorry. Yes. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Thank, thanks for the presentation so far. Um, what are the, what you're saying? What what is the precise enumeration of boundary conditions that you have in mind? Because usually what you would say is when you sum over you know, you, what are you fixing? You're fixing the metric data at infinity up to, yes. you know, yes. within the conformal class. And that would actually mandate that right. they, they tell you that there's an infinity of, of bulk samples related by what on the boundary you would call SL2Z uh, transformations. Yes. So, so, so what's, you're, you're projecting to one cell? Yes, yes. How are you doing so it's that? It's, well, it's related to the second comment that I was uh, just about to make. So this, there's only one style solution, of course, for this particular partition function, unlike the entire you know, SL2Z invariant construction one might uh, perform. Mm -hmm. And that means in this case that if I'm given a beta and a mu, so temperature and a chemical potential, we just get a unique rotating BTZ black hole for which the mass and the angular momentum match with the, the temperature and the chemical potential that I specified. So instead of giving you an entire, like a conformal uh, a torus with just a modular parameter, I'm also giving you the information which cycle is time and which cycle is space, or which, where's the temperature uh, and where's the chemical potential? Uh, so the data that you're proposing to fix is not st the standard ADF CFD prescription where you fix the boundary metric modulo, you know, with the conformal class of the boundary metric that you have in mind. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like um, at this point forgetting 2D CFD if you want. Uh, uh -huh. Just, well, what you would do for. Um, uh, well, for non-conformal models, mm -hmm. if you define, try to define them on a torus. Mm -hmm. And if I, well, if I, compared to the conformal case where you, you would just give, or I would just give you the, the, the modulus on its own, here I'm telling you which, which, which one is time and which one is space, essentially. But, but how, how can so we you already do, know? Sorry, uh, how, how can you do this in a, in a covariant way? Um, uh, what is well, the, you know, how, how, what is the boundary condition? You I'm, know, not, sure, I'm not sure if, if, you, if, if one necessarily has to, right? And, okay. Uh, and, and, well, maybe a way of saying this is that this is a, an instruction that's consistent within, you know, SL2 times well, SL2. Maybe, maybe but, but, but just, just maybe very pragmatically, 
uh, if you yeah. follow these these steps of doing the the path circle that I had on the on the previous slide, so you know as, as you as you did in your paper, um, well, if you follow these steps, and then we impose a holonomy condition, a specific one, and there's you know of course yeah. many choices, you can isolate a single character depending on which cycle you impose a holonomy on. So these are things that you can write down. This is the answer of a calculation of a gravitational path integral. Sure. That that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Sure. So this is not. I'm, this is, of course, not producing a full-fledged two D CFT on the boundary. It is just sure, sure, sure. I was just wondering condition. what the boundary conditions were, like from a from a boundary point of view, where you know you sum over all configurations consistent with boundary conditions. What the precise boundary conditions were that would select this one saddle, and what you're saying, I guess, is that it, it really well, it's this holonomy it's, condition. Is this holonomy condition? But you impose these at the level of the gauge connection, so. You already leave mm -hmm. them the metric formulation. You go to the gauge formulation, and then you impose a holonomy condition, and you you precisely pick this one. From the, you, you might in the argue that because you don't want you would, to do that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's something else. But this this is uh, well, it's a procedure you can do, and it isolates just one saddle. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um. Well. I'm not necessarily trying to convince you that you know you should do this. I'm just trying to convince you that you can do this, and this would be something that is very similar in the end to JT gravity with all of the same deficiencies and all of the same. Uh, so, so it's a direct generalization of this thing. That's all I'm saying. Uh, um, may, may I ask you a question about uh, this actually? Yeah. Um, so, but we agree that this boundary condition. Let's see. It, it has no equivalent in metric formulation, right? Sorry, can you repeat? It has... the, the boundary condition that selects uh, one BTZ saddle has yes. no equivalent. It's a holonomy in... condition. Yeah, it has no equivalent in metric formulation. Well, why why not? I, I'm not sure. I'm not convinced I, I'm just... that it doesn't. It's just natural to formulate it in the gauge theory language. Well, I just don't know what it would be in metric formulation. Um, wouldn't it be that the temporal circle is contractible in the bulk? Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. That that's what I've drawn here as well, right? So there's nothing yeah. in there. The holonomy like measures whether there's an object in there. So here, there's nothing in there. This is the same as the JT disk partition function because that one, well, it's just a disk, so there's nothing in there, and the boundary of the disk is the Euclidean time, so the holonomy around the boundary is also trivial. So we're doing the same thing. We're imposing no holonomy around the, the time direction. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, well, now also, well, I want to make one uh, comment uh, in that, and this is also definitely related to uh, the paper by, by Kotler and Jensen, uh, is that in the older literature, it's sometimes stated incorrectly that 3D gravity is uh, just dual to the 2D Liouville CFT and the 2D Liouville CFT on the torus has this type of partition function. So it's also composed of some linear combination of the Firozoro characters with their, well, the chiral and anti-chiral parts. And in particular, it's a diagonal combination of the chiral sectors with a flat measure. So there's no measure, uh, no P-dependent measure here. Now, uh, the proposal that I've written down here, just this one, uh, well, it's different than that. First of all, it contains independent left and right uh, quantum numbers, uh, allowing also for rotating black hole states in the in the Hilbert space, as I mentioned. And two, it has a non-flat measure, which is, which is just the Firasoro modular S matrix. So it differs in these two ways from the Liouville uh, 2D CFT. And in particular, in this sense, it also um, addresses this problem that Liouville CFT actually has far too few high energy states to explain uh, the BTC black hole entropy because this partition function is actually just the same as the one for a free boson. And this is sometimes called the CF, well, the effective center of charge equals one problem that uh, Liouville CFT has. This, um, well, this partition function here, so this grand canonical partition function, it doesn't have these kinds of problems. We just reproduce the BTC black hole entropy as a semi classical saddle of this grand canonical partition function. Okay, so so well, I mentioned this this motivation definitely from trying to construct something that is similar to JT gravity, but one dimension higher. 
Um, let me now mention the limits in which we can go back to JT gravity from three-dimensional gravity. So these would be uh, constraints, if you want, that link this type of model to the one we have in lower dimensions and the one we believe we understand uh, at least better. Uh, and the simplest link is, again, in the, in the metric language, uh, just consider a spherically symmetric metric ansatz for 3D pure gravity. So I've written a 3D metric here, but that is spherically symmetric. So mu and u, I call the time and radial coordinate. And then we have this new angular coordinate in 3D, which is identified with uh, 2 pi periodicity. Um, then it is an, an old observation that if you just plug this three-dimensional spherically symmetric ansatz in the Einstein-Hilbert action uh, with the well negative cosmological constants here, uh, you just find immediately the JT action. And where the dilaton field in JT gravity, uh, it just comes from this metric component, this G phi phi uh, metric component of your spherically symmetric uh, geometry. So in this sense, uh, well, we have this old statement that JT gravity describes the spherically symmetric fluctuations of 3D uh, pure gravity. Now I should, well, I want to emphasize here that this is not a near extremal near horizon regime of some higher dimensional black holes. Uh, this holds even for the uncharged BTC black holes and far away from the horizon, but it is of course very specific to 3D gravity. So this, this has no universality value, unlike this near extreme or near horizon statement that one has. Okay, so now let's uh, go again to our uh, exact expression of our, of our 3D gravity partition function. So this grand canonical partition function. And let's observe that if we do if you study this thing in the double scaling in a double scaling regime, where C is very large, so we were taking a like a classical limit for the central charge, but at the same time we're focusing on very low temperatures, so uh, very high betas. Beta is scaling with C, and which is becoming very large. Uh, we still retain a quantum theory, but descendants in this model then scale out, and in particular our partition function, this grand canonical uh, partition function, it it just uh, looks like that. And it's essentially the square of a JT partition function. So it's a JT partition function for the chiral sector and, a, and another one for the, for the anti-chiral sector. So the measures, the cinch times cinch measure just becomes uh, P times cinch two pi P, which was the JT measure again. So there's this limit, uh, this well scaling limit that I mentioned here, where we can just go back to the JT partition function, but we have two of them. We have the square of, uh, of it. Now, how do we explain this from, from the action? Why, why is this true? Why does this limit give you two copies of JT gravity seemingly? Uh, well, it, this is, of course, easiest to see from the Chern-Simons uh, description, because also there we have two separate copies of an action, uh, the PSL to R Chern-Simons action. And well, we're looking at uh, the scaling regime where beta over L becomes large. So beta over L large. So that means one of the two cycles of the torus becomes large. So, well, just by conformal invariance, we can think of this equivalently as the other cycle uh, becoming small. So there's, you can think of this as small and angular phi periodicity. And because the phi cycle of our torus was not uh, contractible, this just projects us on the Klein zero mode in the angular phi direction. So if you do that on the 3D churn simons action, uh, you perform a dimensional reduction, essentially projecting on the zero mode in the, in the phi direction, you just get the BF uh, model where what is called B here is just the A phi component. So the phi component of the of the three-dimensional gauge field becomes the B field in the BF language. And of course, you also extract, well, uh, the thing that I call delta phi here, which was this uh, small uh, angular periodicity and this limit. So the delta phi is going to zero. So it looks like the action would become zero uh, unless we scale the prefactor in a way such that the other factors go to infinity so that the product of these two factors remains finite. And these factors are precisely L over Gn, which is, uh, well, C is the brown Hanau central charge. So that one has to go to infinity in a suitable way so that this entire prefactor becomes finite. So that's precisely this double scaling regime that we observed here, but now at the level of the, of the action of the uh, first order formulation of 3D gravity. So we end up with a doubled BF model based on the PSL2R group. And while well, this was precisely, or one uh, BF model was precisely the first order formulation of JT gravity. So this shows uh, well, at level of the action how you would get something that looks like two copies of JT gravity as we have observed already at level of uh, the partition function. Now, uh, this, this also corresponds to, to a metric ansatz 
um, well, so, so we, we projected on um, the zero mode and the angular phi direction. So that means that the gauge connection is independent of phi. And then the gauge connection is, of course, related to the metric to, well, first of all, to the, the, the field bind and the spin connection, and then to the metric. So that means that we uh, consider or, or this corresponds to a metric ansatz for which all of the metric components are independent of the third coordinate of phi. So this corresponds to this one. Um, and well, I do want to point out to link this with the, the observation we had on the previous slide is that if we set this function here to zero, so that's the function that would allow for, let's say, rotating geometries. If we set that to zero, then we get the spherically symmetric metric ansatz again. And from the level of this argument here, what that does is that setting this one to zero, it actually identifies these two BF models you have here. So in the end, you get a single BF model and a single JT gravity. So this is, this is how you get back to the standard statement of the spherically symmetric sector of 3D gravity is just JT gravity. But here we get a, a stronger statement. Uh, we don't have to impose a spherical symmetry and we get two copies of JT gravity. So this is um, well. So this was one of the limits, and and well, maybe to to test whether this is this is really true, we can try to take that limit also in other observables next to this partition function. And one of the observables that's more complicated uh, in three D gravity is this boundary is the boundary two point function. So we insert two boundaries on our on the boundary of our torus uh, like this. So one of them is well at the origin, and the other one is Euclidean time t e and angular coordinate phi. And then we insert these in this, this grand canonical partition function. Now, this can be computed generically using 2D CFT techniques in terms of uh, conformal blocks, in this case, the torus two-point block, in terms of something uh, that looks like this, uh, where you have um, OPE coefficients, you have the blocks, and you have integral over, integrals over intermediate states. So this is not super illuminating to write down, uh, unless you can get a handle on these blocks here. But using techniques from, uh, from this paper, uh, you can show that in the regime of interest, and that was this double scaling regime where you let the central charge uh, become much larger. And simultaneously, well, previously we had low temperature. In this case, this means low uh, Euclidean time separation between these operators and also low uh, beta minus T. So both these numbers need to be, um, need to be um, large. Um, and this, lim well, you can show that this, um, this object here then limits to a product of two uh, JT two-point functions, um, which is, well, which matches with the one we had on the first, uh, the first few slides of the talk. So, so what, the, what this shows is that it's not just a partition function. You can take this limit also for other objects and you can see you find two of these, uh, two of the JT uh, calculations. Okay. So, so that was everything that I wanted to say about this proposal of, um, of a 3D gravity partition function. So now let's try to use this proposal to understand uh, other aspects as well. Uh, and in particular, I want to focus on trying to understand factorization of gravity across entangling surfaces. And well, hey, to, to derive sorry, or to, can I... to get an express, yes. Hey, yeah, just a, a quick question. Sorry, this is um, on the previous slide. It's just yeah. something that's probably completely obvious to you that that's uh, it's a basic question. Um, so you both in JT and in this regime of 3D gravity, you're writing correlation functions in terms of you know suitable integrals over um, this this Hil of, of effective Hilbert space. Um, normally, when we have correlation functions, there's a numerator and then like a normalization factor in the denominator. Mm -hmm. Oh like, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm ignoring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not dividing oh, by the are, partition good. function necessarily. Good, good. These, these are the unnormalized correlators. Okay, these are Great. the unnormalized ones. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, okay, so so let's try to use uh, this this uh, proposal of 3D gravity that's closely related to JT gravity to try to understand how factorization would work across entangling uh, surfaces of 3D gravity. So let's first go back to the JT case. And well, I'll try to explain how that works, and then we can see how that can be generalized to 3D gravity. So let's first go to an even simpler than JT. Let's go to a compact group a BF model and a compact group BF model uh, on, a, on a geometry that has a boundary. So this is, again, the BF action. This is the boundary term uh, with these boundary conditions on the boundary. 
now, uh, well, as is well known and studied uh, throughout the years, um, if, we, if we path integrate over this B field, this B field appears as a Lagrange multiplier. You force F to be zero, which means that the connection is flat. If you plug that back in the boundary action, you get this thing, and then the boundary action becomes a particle moving on a group manifold. Now, the Hilbert space of this particle on a group system is, is very easy. Of course, it's just L squared of G, the quadratically integrable, uh, quadratic integral functions on, on uh, the group manifold G, which by the Peter Weil theorem is then spanned by the set of all unitary uh, irreducible representation matrix elements, which, uh, well, we can denote like that. So RMN is the notation for a representation matrix element with M and N, the two indices that run within each representation. And then G is uh, like the coordinates, uh, G is like the X coordinate, if you want, in, in 1D quantum mechanics. So these form a basis of L squared of G. Uh, and well, you can write them in this way. Now, you, you can think of this, uh, this wave function, these representation matrix elements, as a state as being defined on an interval where one of the indices, let's say M, is on the left side and the N index is on the right side. Now, a state defined on an interval, uh, it can be factorized just using uh, group theory, essentially, which is all of the ingredients we need for the BF uh, model. Just using this defining property here that the representation matrix of the product of the group elements is the product of the representation matrices where there's a sum over this intermediate label that I call S here. And more formally, you can just use this property to define what you want to call a factorization map, something that allows one interval to split into two pieces that I call uh, I here, where we take one wave function and we map it to two wave functions, so two intervals, and it acts in this way. So we take one of these representation matrix elements and we map it to, uh, well, another representation matrix element, but evaluate on the product of two group elements, G1 and G2. So explicitly, it's something like that. And then we just use this property to decompose this into a, a sum of products of uh, separate representation matrix elements. So geometrically, this corresponds to uh, starting out with this uh, interval with endpoints, endpoint labels M and N, and just splitting it into somewhere in the middle where we introduce a new uh, dummy label that we call S here, and we're summing over this S label, um, well, in order to match it to the original state. So this is how one could one can factorize states um, in in the BF model, and this is, by the way, also precisely the same on how one would do it in two D Young Mills uh, theories. Okay, now now well, this is for uh, arbitrary groups and JT gravity, and uh, can be written or interpreted in its uh, first order uh, formulation as a BF model based on um, well, a group structure related to PSL2R. Um, so, so we can just try to use this, uh, but we need some additional, uh, well, there are some additional um, things that happen here. And one of these is that the representation indices at the boundaries, and if they are holographic, they are constrained and fixed. Um, this, these are simply the implementation of the brown henno boundary conditions. So let's denote them by this, uh, well, this strange I that I have here. Um, and now let's consider a particular uh, state with two endpoints, a particular two-sided state, the Hartle-Hawking state, uh, which I've drawn here. And I've denoted, as I mentioned here, the endpoints by I, and I'm going to give them a subscript, subscript L and R to denote the left endpoint and the right endpoint. Then I can write the Hartle-Hawking state for JT gravity as this particular state. So it's an integral over k. So this is the same k variable we had earlier. There's a square root of k sinh 2 pi k and e to the minus beta over 2 k squared. And then we have this two-sided state here, k, and then i left, i right. So this thing here is, this, is the analog of the state that lives here, but with a representation label k. So this is the thing that we uh, know how to split in two pieces from the previous slide. So this is the Hartle-Hawking state, and by definition, it satisfies the property that if you uh, take this state and you, uh, well, compute its norm squared, you just get the partition function. So that means you take the bottom half of the disk and you glue it to the top half and you get back the full disk. So this K label, uh, well, um, it's a representation label, and in this case, it's a continuous label of the principal series uh, irreducible representations of SL2R. 
And this state here, this two boundary state, uh, well, you can also think of this as a, as a wormhole state connecting two holographic boundaries from the left end to the right end. Now, these individual states that appear here, so this K-I-L-I-R that appears here, so we can try it like this, um, this interval here, we'll just use the same factorization that we uh, used on the previous slide, the group theory factorization. You can factorize this state just using, uh, well, just by inserting um, a dummy index that I call S here and uh, taking the product of representation matrices. And this new index S, again, we're summing over it. So this is an unconstrained index. Uh, and it's also continuous. It turns out to be uh, continuous because we're studying a non compact group in this case. So we can combine now all of these ingredients and take our Hartle-Hawking state and apply this same factorization map on this state. This factorization map, it acts on this particular state, which we then decompose into a product of two states using this property, just like we had on the previous slide. And if you do that, you find something like that. Now, uh, well, a technicality here uh, is that you see this V appearing here. This V is the regularized volume of our group manifold. And because we have a non-compact group manifold, this volume is strictly speaking infinitely large, whereas for a compact one, you can normalize it uh, to be one. Um, so, so there are these volume factors that appear here, and I will drop these in most of the subsequent things that I want to mention. Now, uh, the states that appear here, so you have a left interval and a right interval, and they, uh, they, have, they share an endpoint where you have the label S. We will call these states uh, one-sided or black hole uh, states. So here I draw the picture of what we have done now. So we have the semi-disk that defines the Hartle-Hawking state. And here on this state at the top, we have inserted uh, an, a dummy index S and we have split this interval in a left piece and a right piece. Uh, and now you can follow the, well, the standard uh, method. Uh, we, we, we can compute a reduced density matrix by tracing out uh, one half of this system, let's say the left uh, region. So we, we take our Hartle-Hawking state uh, we well, and then we trace out the left piece uh, from this uh, density matrix. You get this reduced density matrix, and this is just a thermal density matrix. And then you can compute its von Neumann entropy of this thermal density matrix, and you find something that looks like that. So it has a this p of k that appears here, which is uh, a probability distribution. It's normalized to one uh, plus a second term. You have an integral over k p of k log dim k. Uh, and well, if you're familiar with the entanglement entropy of edge states or of uh, lattice gauge theory, then these terms uh, might look familiar. So it has precisely the same form. Um, and well, I've already mentioned it here because this is just the thermal density matrix. This, in particular, this von Neumann entropy, it matches the thermal entropy of the JT disk partition function that we started with. Uh, so we already knew Z of beta and we already knew how to compute the thermal entropy with this. But what we have done here is we have succeeded in formulating a factorization map for which the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix matches this thermal entropy. And well, this is done fully quantum mechanically, but in particular on the semi-classical saddle, this von Neumann entropy is dominated by the second term is just log of the dimension of K, which is K cinch to pi K evaluated at the saddle. And this was just the black hole entropy again. Okay, so um, well, the next thing that I want to mention is that these, these one-sided black hole states, these states that you get if you try to factorize the two-sided state by inserting complete set of states uh, in the middle. So we had this extra label S there. So I call these one-sided black hole states. And I want to interpret these as edge states. So let me mention some properties of these states in order to motivate this interpretation. The first is that, uh, well, it's labeled by three labels, K, S, and I. This I label is living all the way at the asymptotic boundary. This, is, this has nothing to do with what happens at the entangling surface or what happens at the black hole horizon. It's the other two labels that matter. And the first, um, the S label itself, it's, it's labeling the microstates of a black hole. Uh, and it, in particular, it explains the black hole degeneracy in the sense that if you sum over all of these S labels, so if you just count how many there are, which is uh, well, you, you need to interpret correctly how you do this because it's a continuous number, but up to a volume regulator again, this is precisely reproducing the case inch to pi k factor, the degeneracy that we had of our black hole. 
Um, and then the K label itself, that just labels the macroscopic property of the black hole or the energy, uh, because K squared was just the energy of our space time. Now, both of these quantum numbers, uh, they cannot be changed by local observers in the bulk. So the S for the S label, it's obvious because the S label is really living at the entangling surface or at the black hole horizon. You cannot access it unless you go through the black hole horizon. If you're an outside observer, you cannot uh, get to get to that S label or change that S label or do anything with it. But also the K label you cannot change because if you try to change K, which is also the total energy in your space time. So if you try to change it by adding some energy or something from, from the boundary or doing something, uh, what happens is that, well, you just get separate regions with different Ks uh, as you know, uh, we know from the JT uh, or the structure of the JT correlation function. So the, so the value of K at the horizon or at the entangling surface cannot be changed by any observer who doesn't cross the black hole horizon or the entangling surface. So that means that these one-sided Hilbert spaces, they decompose into super selection sectors labeled by K and S. So we can really call these edge states. Uh, I also want to mention here that these edge state degrees of freedom, they're not uh, the microscopic discrete UV degrees of freedom. They are effective degrees of freedom that only and, and their only uh, success is that they can correctly count the black hole entropy, but they give no hint at their UV completion. So it's just accounting uh, that is done correctly. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions about this. So the, the Hilbert space of the two-sided wormhole, is the states are labeled by K and S is the claim, as opposed to just K. So, sorry, can can you the two sided? Yeah, these are these are state. How to say? Um, you know, your Hartle Hawking state is is preparing like initial state for two sided uh, yeah. black hole in in real time, right? And yes. so you get a, a Hilbert space. It, it, am I understanding this correctly? That your Hilbert space of states for the two sided black hole that those states would be labeled by K and S. No, but well, this S label is when you split it in half. So this S label uh -huh. is the one you would use from the outside of a single horizon. This is not for someone uh -huh. who has access to the full good, slides. Good. Okay, good, 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 no, good. So, so this, is... This, is, this, is, this is identical to, to factorizing Wilson lines in a gauge theory where you just need to add surface charges uh, to uh -huh. the entangling surface. And here, here we have done the analog of this, but in the uh -huh. SL2R. Good, so you have a, a local operator inserted here at the bifurcation yeah. surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which, which we call edge here. states in this case. Uh, they're the thing mm -hmm. that you need to insert in order to be able to split uh, object between a left piece and a right piece. Good, so and that allows you to the reproduce the, the disk this way. Um, yes. Yeah. Are there some other instructions that would allow you to reproduce the double trumpet? Since if you were to go into real time, then now you have a strip and you can compactify and you can get a, cil um, a cylinder. I mean, you can get you can get a disk by stitching two of these you, together, you want, but you can also you want to you want to go to the two boundary amplitude. Yeah, the yeah. double trumpet. Um, yeah. Well, um, we have we haven't definitely we definitely haven't done that. So this this is all uh -huh. purely disk level that I'm saying here. Um, uh -huh. And this is also, well, when I say factorization here, I, I mean the old way or the old meaning of factorization, just like in gauge theories, when you have an interval, how do you mm -hmm. split it in half? I don't sure. mean the, the factorization puzzle, of course, this is. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, I'm just curious how much mileage you can get from this perspective. Yeah. Well, okay. the interesting Thanks. thing is you add new degrees of freedom at the horizon labeled by S and these okay. S labels you have, if you interpret it correctly, um, the number of these S labels, it actually gives you the k inch 2 pi k degeneracy. So it's counting for you the black hole uh, degeneracy in the Hilbert space of JT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what it's doing. Um, just by analogy with the, the compact group to the young right. and BF stories. Um, I probably need Thank to you. go a little bit faster, uh, I think. Um, okay, now, uh, well, I, I want to make an observation here. Um, you can characterize these edge degrees of freedom by, um, well, by what is called a shrinkability constraint or shrinkability condition in the sense that if I, if I have the JT disk with the boundary of length beta 
and I make a small hole here in the center with uh, circumference epsilon. Uh, and then I take epsilon to zero. So I, I shrink this hole. We should actually just reproduce the, the disk uh, again. So, so shrinking this hole should be a smooth process, a smooth process in our, in our model. Uh, and th this has a physical meaning, this, this, this uh, constraint here, because the circumference of this inner circle here, you can view this as a regulator of the black hole horizon or of the entangling surface, where epsilon to the minus one would be the, well, it eventually goes to infinity and this corresponds to the infinite temperature you have at the entangling surface. Now you can evaluate this left uh, diagram here in, well, in, in the closed string channel, if you will. So just by evaluating from the outer uh, circle, you evaluate to the inner circle using gluing formulas and JT gravity. Um, so our total expression for this left-hand side, you can view it as a gluing integral over a gluing parameter that I call lambda of some inner object times some outer object. The outer object is just a single trumpet you would have in, in JT gravity. So you glue up to some uh, geodesic uh, that's in between the outer and the inner circle. And now we need to, uh, well, let's keep an open mind at this point and just see what the inner part here is supposed to be if we demand this shrinkability condition. So we need to have that this object here with the two boundaries, the outer boundary and the inner boundary should have the property that if we shrink the inner boundary to zero, we should just get the full disk partition function, which we already know is the JT disk partition function. So this uniquely determines that this inner piece has to look like this. So it's, well, it's an integral over K and then K cinch two pi K. So the entire measure that we have in JT gravity times the cosine two pi lambda K times this exponential factor here. And now, well, you can check that if you take this, this formula and this outer formula and you do the integral over lambda, well, the integral of uh, cosine times cosine just produces a delta function that says their K labels equal. And you just find the JT disk partition function if you take epsilon to go to zero, which removes this piece as well. So you can see that uh, gluing this inner and outer piece together <clears throat> in the limit epsilon goes to zero produces the, the, the full disk partition function again. So what you can learn from this is that this density of states, k cinch to pi k, is actually produced entirely from the inner piece because this outer piece doesn't have it. It's the inner piece that actually has this k cinch to pi k. Uh, and hence, it fully originates from the edge degrees of freedom. OK, so that was everything that I wanted to say about this uh, factorization across entangling surfaces uh, for JT gravity. So now let's try to write down all of the analog formulas for 3D gravity. And I'll go a bit faster here. Uh, for the sake of time. So, uh, well, we proceed in parallel to JT gravity. And the first step is to write down the hartle hawking state. So for JT, it was uh, the path integral on the half disk. Here is the path integral on the half of a torus. So we slice open the full torus halfway, and we get a geometry that looks like that, uh, where we integrate, we do the gravitational path integral over the interior of this half torus, and we produce a state that lives on this um, annulus shape at the top here. And well, the expression that you can write down for the hartle hawking state, it looks a bit complicated, but morally it's, it's relatively simple. Uh, compared to JT, the only thing you do is you just add descendants and you take a holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic sector. So this is what this formula is doing. And one can check that it has the property that it's norm squared is just uh, this 3D gravity uh, partition function that we started with in this talk. Now, just like I mentioned this uh, condition or this constraint of being able to shrink a hole in the disk in JT, we can demand an analogous shrinkability condition for 3D gravity. And in this case, uh, instead of the solid torus, we sort of uh, excise a smaller uh, torus from it. And we demand that if we shrink the smaller torus back to zero, we should reproduce the full torus partition function. So this would be the 3D analog of this uh, shrinkability constraint. So again, we compute this amplitude by analogy with JT by gluing together an inner piece and an outer piece, and then take the size of this inner piece to go to zero in the end. Now, again, the outer piece, the outer piece we, we know, we know already, uh, just like in JT. In this case, this is just, uh, well, a usual Firasdoro character for a non-degenerate representation. So we get an expression that looks like that. So 
this this really looks like this um, single trumpet amplitude already in JT. It has the same structure. The only thing we add to it essentially are some descendants at the at the boundary of this the outer boundary of the solar torus. And now to implement the shrinkability condition, so we demand that we reproduce the solar torus amplitude um, if we take the the inner um, um, the inner torus to go to zero. Um, and we already know the outer piece, we can deduce what the inner piece has to be in order to match this, and it looks like that. So again, very similar to JT, you get an integral, you get this cosine that you use to glue these things together, and then you get the full dimension coming from the inner piece. So again, the density of states, uh, which I write down as dim QP, so this is this cinch times cinch thing, it fully comes from the inner boundary or from the entangling surface. So all of these degrees of freedom should be living at the inner boundary at the black hole horizon eventually, or at the entangling surface. Now, what is new and what is perhaps a little bit surprising at this point is that if we really demand the shrinkability condition, there can be no descendants at the entangling surface. So there are descendants at the outer boundary, at the holographic boundary, but if we demand the shrinkability, there's no one over eta that's being produced here. So there, what we find is that you shouldn't have descendants at the entangling surface. And this is, well, unlike usual boundaries in, in um, uh, 3D churn science. Okay, so now let's try to formulate uh, in the same way as previously this factorization map, this map that allows you to make from one interval to create two intervals, but one dimension higher. So, um, well, let's first write down a generic two boundary state in 3D gravity. Uh, so I write my state like that. So it's labeled by P plus and P minus for the chiral and antichiral piece. There's two labels, IL and IR for the holographic boundaries of my two boundary states. And then there's two arbitrary descendant labels on the left boundary and the right boundary. So here we have a state defined on this annular region. It has a left boundary, this inner boundary, and it has a right boundary, this outer boundary. So these are two holographic boundaries here. And now let's try to split this. So we want to split this uh, along this black circle here. So we introduce an index S, just like we split the interval in two pieces. Here we're splitting the annulus in an inner annulus and an outer annulus. So we do that by uh, writing down this factorization map, uh, which is the same as the one in JT. But again, just like we uh, argued on the previous slide, uh, we don't write anything with descendants on this interior surface. So we write down these, these states, these one-sided states, as having a P plus and a P minus label, and then I L S. So this is the same as it was for JT gravity. So just the left label on one holographic boundary and the S label on the interior entangling surface, and only one descendant label. That's the one that was on the holographic boundary. No descendant label at the entangling surface. Um, and then given this factorization map, uh, or to show that this factorization map leads to something sensible, we can play the same game as for JT gravity. So we apply this map to the full hartle hawking state. Then we trace over one of the sectors, let's say the left sector, and then you get a thermal density matrix for which the von Neumann entropy matches the thermal entropy that we started with in our proposal for 3D gravity. And well, I've just written it out here for completeness, but it has a very similar form to the one for JT gravity. And in particular, in the semi-classical regime, uh, the entropy is, is uh, just like it was log of uh, the dimension for JT, which was log and then k cinch 2 pi k evaluated on the saddle. Here we have an analogous formula in the semi-classical regime. Um, so, well, well, now that we, we can reproduce uh, the, the 3D uh, thermal entropy and the BTZ black hole entropy as an entanglement entropy and in the semi-classical regime is just log of this cinch times cinch for the left piece times cinch times cinch for the right piece so the formula we had here well can we understand the, the gravitational states that are actually entangled so in generic QFTs of course this is the formula for the entanglement entropy uh, across an entangling surface there, so there's this uh, UV divergent terms and then there's a finite term now, if we apply that to three space-time dimensions, you just get a well a linear divergence, so proportional to the well proportional to the length of the entangling surface divided by UV regulator epsilon plus a finite piece. Now, for a particular QFT, the 3D Chern-Simons uh, theory, 
this this formula has been computed explicitly. Uh, and if you do that for a state that has a Wilson line in the representation R crossing the entangling surface, this is the formula you find by explicit calculation. So this matches this uh, sort of generic expectation. So you find this divergent term L, length of the entangling surface divided by epsilon, plus a finite piece. Now, very briefly, uh, the first two terms in this formula are the vacuum entanglement entropy, and which contains in particular this divergent term. And it's, I think, well, it's interesting to briefly mention uh, some aspects of this divergent term. The first is that it's proportional to the length L that appears in the numerator. But you can ask, how, how can this length actually appear? Because it's in a 3D churn simons theory, which is a topological quantum field theory. How is it sensitive to the length of the entangling surface? Well, it appears from a background boundary metric that is introduced at the entangling surface, and that breaks the topological invariance of the churn simons bulk. So you need to introduce a metric uh, on the entangling surface, and that metric is measuring this length, and that's where this physical length is coming from in this term. Now it's of course divergent. It, it goes as one over epsilon, and you can trace this uh, divergence as it's coming from the descendants of um, the WCW model that is supposed to live at this at this entangling surface, because we're doing churn simons. We have an entangling surface where we have a WCW model which has descendants on it, and then the number of descendants is essentially giving you the divergence one over epsilon as epsilon is going and epsilon is going to zero because we have an infinite number of descendants. So this is the story for ordinary churn simons as it uh, was studied uh, several years ago. And then this last term, this log dim QR, is, is uh, well, perhaps the most interesting one is the anion defect entropy or the topological entanglement entropy in 3D churn simons. So here I've written the formula again. Now, now the main question is, uh, can we apply this formula to 3D gravity in its first order formulation? And does it make sense? Well, there are two issues with it. Uh, the first is that, um, well, if we interpret 3D churn Simons, so SL2R times SL2R churn Simons, as describing 3D uh, gravity, then there is actually a physical metric, uh, the metric of 3D gravity, which is encoded in the gauge connections A and A bar. So we already have metric information in the gauge connection. So there is actually tension with identifying um, or with having two metrics a priori, the metric that's encoded in the gauge connections and this background metric we needed to introduce sort of ad hoc at the entangling surface uh, in 3D churn Simons. And there's tension with identifying these two metrics. So what you learn from this, and this is uh, well just a general argument, this has nothing to do with the calculations that I was showing you earlier, is that if we try to interpret 3D gravity as churn Simons times churn 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 Simons times churn churn, Simon's amplitude, sorry. Um, uh, and we, we just use this, this formula for uh, the Chern Simon's uh, entanglement entropy. That that first term, it actually has nothing to do with the actual black hole area because that black hole area, so that length, is measured not with the metric that is used to define this L here. This, this L, this length is measured with this ad hoc introduced metric at the boundary of Chern Simon's. Whereas our physical metric is actually encoded in A, that's the metric we should be using in order to find the black hole area. So there's this, this sort of tension here between this first term having anything to do uh, with A over 4G. Now, a second problem here, and this is not the case for a compact group churn Simons, but it is the case for, um, for, for the non compact case, is that this uh, S00 here, so this is a modular S matrix. For gravity, this is the Vera Zoro modular S matrix, um, but S00 is zero for gravity. So, so there's also a divergence coming from this term. So, so there's issues with these with both of these terms and trying to identify them with um, uh, the bekenstein hawking formula. Well, a solution, of course, is to just remove these terms. But how, how can we remove these terms? Well, this corresponds to just removing descendants at the entangling surface, which is precisely what we have done in our factorization map. And then you just get this last term, log dim QR, which was indeed the term we computed explicitly. So what we, well, or the interpretation that we can provide with this is that our gravitational entanglement entropy, it matches this anion defect entropy that people study in, in topological quantum field theory. 
and it also matches with the topological entanglement entry. So it's just log dim r, log dim qr. Um, well, I'm probably almost out of time, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure precisely when I started, but... Uh, we started a couple of minutes late and we asked lots of questions. So if you, if you need a couple of more minutes. Okay. Um, well, I was going to say something more now about this, this group theory structure that is underlying these models, because I've been sort of vague about this throughout this, throughout the entire talk. And I always call these objects dim R and dim QR. So why do I call them like that? Um, so let me briefly mention some things and then I'll, then I'll conclude. Sounds good. Um, so, so, so what is this group theoretic structure precisely that is underlying JT and 3D uh, gravity? Now for 3D gravity, uh, well, it's governed by an object that's related to the quantum deformation of SL2R. So here I've written down the quantum algebra UQ SL2R like that with three generators H, E, and F and a deformation parameter Q. Now 3D gravity is not governed directly by this, but, but instead by two copies of it, chiral and antichiral pieces. And each of these are, are the, what is called the modular double. And they're, they consist of taking two quantum deformed algebras of SL2R and adding them together, one of them with deformation parameter Q and one of them with Q tilde. So this modular double here consists of two commuting copies of the UQ SL2R quantum algebra and their deformation parameters are related like that. So they're both phases, but one of them is with parameter B and the other one is with parameter one over B. And this B, by the way, is the same B that we had uh, all the way in the beginning. So it's the, the small B that appears in the modular S matrix of Virasoro. Um, and it then automatically has two sets of generators, E, H, and F, and they're uh, duals, let's say. So the one with the tildes on it. But it turns out that, well, there's secretly only five generators because this H and H dual, they're actually proportional to each other. And the most important property of this strange quantum group, this modular double of UQSL2R, is it has a preferred set of representations, a con uh, set of continuous irreducible representations that are what is called self-dual, which means they have a symmetry of B goes to one over B. And this set of representations has a Plancherelle measure on it, which is singe times singe. So this is precisely the formula that we had in the beginning. This is precisely the modular rest matrix of Irasura CFD, and this is no coincidence. So that thing was interpreted as a dimension of representation. So if you remember where uh, singe times singe appeared or where for the JT limit K times singe appeared, that was precisely where the dim R appears in the compact group case. So here we see that there are also dimensions of representations, but for uh, continuous representations and the analog then is, is what is called Plancherelle measure. Um, okay, so, well, what I, what I want to mention now briefly is that there, um, okay, yeah, this is the last thing that I want to say about the group structure and then I'll go to the last couple of slides uh, or the last slide. Um, well, briefly, th there is a known statement about quantum groups in that there are uh, two dual ways, well, what is called Hopf dual ways of thinking about quantum groups. The first is as a deformation of the universal enveloping algebra, which is the, the, the form we had on the previous slide is that we take the algebra, or better the universal enveloping algebra, and we deform it to get a quantum algebra. And the second, which is dual to this, is as a deformation of the space of functions on the group, as a deformation of L squared of G. Now, we have a strange quantum group relevant for 3D gravity, which is this modular double. And it has been shown that its dual is the quantum group SLQ2R plus. And this plus thing is the new thing and, and the strange thing. This plus means that all operator entries in this SLQ2R matrix need to have positive spectrum. So there's a positivity constraint on this group theoretic structure. And this quantum group SLQ2R plus is a Q deformation of the JT story, which we have argued is based on SL plus 2R based on a positive semigroup. So it's not really SL2R. It's, it's some strange um, modification of it. So there's a positivity condition added to the group theoretic structure in order to actually get gravity instead of gauge theory. So it's this positivity condition that distinguishes a gauge theory and gravity. And you can be very explicit about this statement. For instance, this, this Blancherelle measure for the principal series representations, if you look at math textbooks and you look at this measure for 
the actual SL2R group, it's the K times a hyperbolic tangent, whereas we actually need to measure K times a, hyper, a hyperbolic sine function. And you can explain this difference by not taking SL2R, but by uh, adding this positivity constraint to it. So let me skip um, some of these things because I'm running out of time and just go to the conclusion. Okay, so, so uh, to conclude this talk, so I used uh, 2D JT gravity as an inspiration in understanding some aspects of 3D pure gravity. I tried to build 3D gravity in a way that parallels the JT story. And in particular, I've written down a proposal of an effective 3D gravity theory that has a JT limit, a doubled uh, JT limit. And then we defined a factorization map, again, inspired by the JT case. We defined a factorization map in 3D gravity for which uh, the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix matches the thermal entropy. And I argued uh, physically that this entanglement entropy that we are computing, it can be identified with the anion defect entropy in TQFT language or with the topological entanglement entropy. And that it's, um, well, this identification is actually equivalent to our constraint of not having descendants present at the entangling surface, which followed from this, uh, or from demanding this shrinkability constraint in the 3D case, which we observed was, to, was true in 2D JT gravity, but demanding that it is tr true in 3D gravity automatically led to no, having no descendants at the entangling surface. And well, very briefly at the end, I mentioned uh, that the quantum or the, the algebraic structure that is actually governing 3D gravity is based on this modular double quantum group. So based on two copies of the UQSL2R uh, quantum algebra. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Thomas, for the, the very nice talk. Um, we asked uh, already a couple of questions, but uh, does anyone has uh, any additional question? Actually, maybe something quick, I probably know the answer to that. This quantum group uh, uh, that you talk about, there's also another one that appears in this uh, double scaled SYK. It, it's it's not the same one, right? It's not the same one. And this this is something that I'm also trying to understand. Um, so so the one in SY, uh, in double scale SYK is based on UQSU11. Right. Whereas the, the one in 3D gravity is based on UQSL2R, but it's not even that in 3D gravity, you need to combine it with its modular dual in this particular way. Now, UQ SL2R and UQ SU11, they're not the same quantum group, even though classically SL2R and SU11 are the same, their Q deformations are going in different directions. And uh, well, there is a way to, to go from one to the other, is that in UQ SL2R, the parameter Q is just a phase uh, so it's living on the unit circle, whereas for UQ um, SU11, uh, the Q is a real number between zero and one, and right. that's the the that's the physical parameter you have in this double scale SYK. Right. So so they're not the same, but there is a, well, there is sort of a way of going from one to the other. If you know some formulas for or some expressions for UQ SU11 or UQ SL2R, and you know them for generic Q, you can try to uh, change q from but, a phase but, to a, a real number but but the representation theory is very different for the phase versus the real number right or yes 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 yeah yeah so it you can't well you cannot analytically continue um everything but for instance the and this is something that we're trying to understand better um the the casimir eigenvalue equation uh so uh essentially like the the well, in this case, it's a difference equation for which you can find all of the irreducible uh, representation uh, matrices uh, as, as eigenfunctions of that. Um, you can go from one to the other just at the level of this difference equation, at the level of this Casimir equation, but the solutions cannot be mapped into one another because some solutions might just not exist and so on. Right, right, right. Yeah. But there are some things that you can, yeah, it, there are some suggestive links that you can try to make. Also, I should mention that this uh, modular double quantum group 
it, it also appears in the uh, CFT and in the gravity as well. So it's not just uh, the algebraic structure that is governing 3D gravity, it's also governing Liouville gravity as well. Thank you. Um, may I ask uh, another question? Um, sure. It's, um, you may have explained it uh, in your talk, but I, I, missed, uh, I missed a little piece, a, ch a chunk of the talk. Um, so you described this, um, the, this, uh, factorization of the hartle hooking state in, in JT. Yes. Uh, and the, the last, you know, in, in this paper of, of Jeff Harris and, um, and Harlow, um, they mentioned at some point that in the canonical quantization of JT, you could not find, um, you, you, you couldn't write the hartle hooking as a, a TFD. And yeah. I was wondering, uh, what's what's your way out, or what's your modification in order for this to be well, possible? Well, there there is a subtlety here, and it I guess it depends on your perspective whether you find it okay or whether you um, say that it ruins everything. In the sense that I had to introduce this volume regulator. Uh, let me try to find it. So you can see it here. Uh -huh. I was sort of very vague on what it is and where it comes from, but it. It's essentially the, the SL2R group manifold is, is, is a non-compact group manifold and it has an infinite volume. Mm -hmm. And you can see an effect of this infinite volume coming uh, in these formats. So you need to regularize this volume, which appears yeah. here. But in the end, of course, this volume is going to infinity. Yeah. So you might say that the presence of this volume factor is sort of, well, you, you cannot make, well, if you're a, like, if you're a pessimist, I would say that, uh, you would say that this this uh, this shows that you cannot factorize uh, things. So by by enforcing factorization, you get a divergence, and you um, you actually define a density of state that, if you don't like this infinite volume, is just ill-defined. Um, well, not ill I mean, like if, if if v is going to infinity, then this argument just. Um, if V is strictly infinity, this argument does not work. And then you might say, well, I cannot factorize this. This. Yeah. But we understand, like, we understand where it comes from. We, we can do everything just like for compact groups, but now it's for non-compact groups. So we, uh -huh. we have this, this volume regulator here. And you know, you can factorize it if you if you add this clarification on what this volume factor is and what it means and where it's where it's coming from. Um, so this is a okay. reservation here. Uh, okay. for this this type of argument. Okay. Well, okay. It's, it's kind of similar also to, to this statement that I made here, that um, we have this S label at the entangling surface, but it's a continuous label. Mm. And then I'm, uh, I'm saying that the black hole entropy is actually reproduced by just counting how many S labels there are, but there's an infinite number of them. There's a continuous infinite number of them. So how do you make sense of that? Well, you can regularize it again and show that this thing is up to a regulator factor, precisely k sinh to pi k. And the regulators that you get here, they would cancel again with the ones you have here in order to get a finite, so all V factors cancel, you get a finite entanglement entropy in the end or a finite thermal entropy in the end. So, so these, these regulator factors, they appear at intermediate steps and it depends on your perspective if you, uh, if you absolutely don't like them, then you would say, well, uh, you cannot do this argument, but uh, I'm trying to advocate that, uh, uh, well, that, that it, it seems physically okay to, mm. to, to do this. So because you get results that look very similar um, to the compact group case. So in some sense, uh, that goes against the argument that so if if you if you trust this construction uh, that goes against the argument of Arlo and Jeffries that there is no holographic dual to uh, canonical JT basically well but because what, what what else are we missing to talk about a holographic dual for the well but there 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 are several so so one of the arguments that is 
that they that they make is for instance that purely the the the, the jt partition function not the two-sided one but just the the mm -hmm. disk partition function uh it doesn't have a hilbert space interpretation and one of the reasons why you would why you might argue for that is that the density of state is uh, k cinch to pi k so it's continuous but it doesn't yeah. have a volume or it doesn't have an ir divergent prefect yeah. which is what you usually would have if you have a continuous system um so so then you might say okay it doesn't have a hilbert space interpretation but you can also say up to this factor of e it's a hilbert space interpretation yeah right? that's so, that's exactly right so yeah. you, so it's like v times or or one of v times trace mm. something right so it's it's it, very it depends on your perspective what one would want <laughs> yes it well indeed it depends on what one what one wants um The, well, these formulas, they are correct the way they're written, and then it just depends on your interpretation on how you would read what it actually means. Mm. Well, thank you. Good. So if we have no further questions for Thomas, let's thank him again. Thank you.